All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of our interview series in AppSec of AppSec Engineer. And today we are with Mr. Dennis Cruz, uh, who is the CTO and CISO of Glasswall Technologies. Uh, I've been following Dennis for a while now, and I think most of the AppSec community uh, follows Dennis for his extremely innovative views on a lot of different things. Uh, Dennis, in my opinion, shares, I think, my uh, passion for automation because he's done a lot of automation and he, uh, he posts about a lot of automation that he works on. So he's one of those folks that's very close to my heart in terms of the work that he does for the community and continues to do for the community. So welcome, Dennis. Welcome to the show. Thank you and, uh, and welcome. It's great to be here. Thanks so much, Dennis. So just tell us a little bit about yourself, Dennis, to get started so that everyone understands what you do and you know how you've gotten here. Cool. So, um, so I've been doing security for quite a while, and um, I've been, um, in a way, in a path that probably started when I was a kid programming on my ZX Spectrum and Amiga, right? So I think I've always been kind of a coder, and then and then I found security as a very interesting intersection of problem solving development, you know, the hacking elements, right? Which is cool, right? You know, it's solving solving things and and the kind of the the so i kind of started like you know by breaking stuff finding problems finding vulnerabilities you know taking the hacking exposed book and trying it out on the internet um and then um and then you know the application security world is something i've, I've been very passionate it was something i've been doing a lot i've done lots of stuff at oasp um and then um and kind of my career sort of sort of started to go from um, so the breaking things into now the, the building, and I did a, I did a project. You know, I was um, you know a director of advanced technology at a company called Ounce Labs, which was they they now become App, AppSec Standard, uh, Scotch, AppSec Source, uh, which was um, uh, from um, IBM the product. And um, but it was very interesting because that that really taught me about static analysis, how to scale, how to think in graphs, etc. And then, and then I kind of moved more into the sort of the consulting, the trying to create AppSec teams, trying to do um, you know the social security champions networks, the the the, the, the pipelines, the, you know dev. I think there was a guy who said you know once that I was doing DevOps or DevSecOps before it was not you know a term, right? You know I've been trying to automate pipelines, trying to make you work, trying to kind of hack the organization to create secure applications, right, and create secure development. And I and I kind of made a, a, a very conscious decision to only go to senior management later in my career. And, and I think this is very important and I highly recommend it because it meant that by the time I become you know, more senior and responsibilities and eventually leading to CISO positions and now actually CTO position, I was very technical, right? I, I felt that I was still the most technical person in the room um, or at least one of the most technical persons and, and be able to follow any conversations, be able to learn things, be able to understand, for example, the cloud at a native way that if you haven't programmed the cloud, if you haven't tried it out, you know, it's just an abstract concept, right? So I find that being technical, it's a massive asset because you understand at very strong depth what's possible and what's not possible, right? So when you delegate, you know the difference between something that should be easy versus something that it's actually, you know, pretty hard to do, right? And it's a wild goose chase and it's not gonna, gonna work. And I think as you get, more senior and you control more budgets and you have more ability to determine what's happening those things are very important if not you know you, you just you know are, are not in control and then i think the latest move i've done which was very interesting was uh, there's a lot of cto cso's that came from it from the cto angle so it's almost like the ctos and then they kind of bundle security into it which kind of becomes you know sometimes a second class citizen it's just like they have other things and security just happens to be one of them more because there's nobody else to do it right um mm -hmm. where i think i came the other way around where i become a cso to become a cto and i think it's, mm -hmm. it's a very cool path because you know first of all you can only do it if you have technical you know uh experience but also means that you have a much stronger understanding a or the challenge of security but b where security adds value in the organization mm -hmm. and almost um uh, and this is something i want to talk about quite a bit here is the fact that i think the security industry and, and us as a practice have evolved in the last decades for the mm -hmm. whole we are enablers you know we are here to make things faster we are here 
to add value. And we kind of got there because we had to, right? Because if we didn't do that, you know, shit wouldn't happen, right? So, so yeah. we kind of had to, you know, evolve, but it, it, and it's a good evolution, right? It's the right thing to do, right? Security is an enabler. Security, when then right, adds value, is done not because, you know, somebody says and it's compliant and all that stuff, is because it really makes a difference in organization, right? And I think that mindset, ironically, not a lot of parts of the organization have, and I think if you have that mindset, when you're given another responsibility, you can add a lot of value on it. So kind of right. in a way, my career came from, you know, breaking stuff, going into the kind of the defense side, which is much harder than breaking, by the way, right? You know, fixing and, and creating resilient systems is harder than breaking it. And then yeah, kind sure. of going into kind of management, but but still very technical. And um, mm -hmm. and, and by the way, and also like, you know, making sure that you stay technical, right? So. One right. of the good things of being senior is that you can control a little bit your schedule. So you have a say whether you spend all your day meetings or you mm -hmm. allocate some of your time or you social engineer yeah. your time into being still a developer and, and writing code, right? Which is important. Right. Right. Wow, that's great. Uh, in fact, in fact, I've been following you a lot more since your time at Photobox, but one of the things I see with you, uh, which has always been something that I'd like to, uh, I, I like to emulate and I admire very much, is that you go full on, right? So you are completely invested in whatever it is that you're working on as part of your organization. I used to see the kind of work you used to put out at Photobox. And even now with Glasswall, I see you constantly sharing information with the community in, in the form of maybe some serverless uh, work that you're doing or something related to Slack automation and using that for security graphs. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I get where you're coming from in the sense that you are technical, but I also feel that uh, one of the things that you've brought to the table that I see is that you are deeply invested in the companies that you work with in the sense mm -hmm. that you you think very deeply about the problems they're solving and problems you are solving for them. Uh, what do you feel, uh, you know, people who are getting into security, especially people, I mean, there are lots of people in different walks of life getting into security. Uh, some of them are more traditional security paths from network security, trying to grapple with cloud and so on. Some of them are just bug bounty folks who are trying to, you know, uh, let's figure out this and try and make some money. That's also one class of folks who are, ha who are coming out in this industry. This industry is kind of evolving every day, so to speak. So mm -hmm. what would be your advice to people who are, you know, trying to make it or make it big in this industry? What would be your perspective on that? All right, cool. There's a good number of stuff to unpack there, right? So I think the first one is, is the passion bit, right? And I think that's regardless, right, of where you are. And regardless of what project you're doing, regardless of what you do, I think that, um, and I, I tell this to, to my team, and right? you know, I said that there's this kind of there's three things that you want to align, right? You want to align what you're good at, what you're passionate about, and what the company wants you to do, right? Because you know, you can be really good at something, but if you're not passionate about it, you know, a you're not going to enjoy it. B you know, you're never going to be you know, there's a limit on that. Um, and, and also, uh, you can be really great at passionate, but if the company doesn't want you to do it or you can't get paid for it, then, you know, it's kind of a tragedy, right? So, you know, I, I think every day, you know, in your career, you make lots of little decisions, right? And I think it's very important that you keep aligning yourself with it. And, and the thing I always done, and, and it's kind of how I keep sanity too, and I think this is also very important, right? I always, whatever company I work for, I always try to understand you know, their values, right? And try to understand, um, you know, what am I doing there? And what, for example, mm -hmm. what does the CEO want? What's the vision of the company? And, and where are they going? And I align myself with a path that I believe, right? So mm -hmm. I, I can always say that I'm doing what I personally believe is the best thing for mm -hmm. the company, right? And I think mm -hmm. that's always very important, right? You know, it's very important that in a way or whatever is paying you, or even if it's a charity or, or a thing, whatever you're working for, right? You mm -hmm. should always align yourself with something that you can be passionate about, right? Because mm -hmm. it makes a difference, right? It, it makes a difference in you in, in, in how you collaborate, you know, how you work, how you think, you know, and even your enjoyment at work, right? You, know, you, you can work three hours and be completely stressed and burn out. You can work or, or be involved 10 hours and, and it doesn't even feel like you've done stuff, right? So I think that's mm -hmm. very important. And, but also to keep sanity, right? Like, you know, I, I've been in place where, you know, you can be argued that 
some parts of the organization didn't understand what I was doing, right? Or they mm -hmm. didn't agree with what I was doing, right? Or mm -hmm. they thought that it was very chaos, although I would argue that we got stuff done, right? But mm -hmm. um, yeah, but as long as you aligned with mm -hmm. something that you could always look a person in the eye and say, you claim this, or th there's these values, and you, you know, the, the, the value of the company is X, Y, Z, I'm going mm -hmm. for those values, right? And I think that's regardless mm -hmm. of security, right? You know, it's it's for everything you do. I think security adds a cool, an important human element, right? And by the way, like this doesn't work for every industry, right? So I, I, mm -hmm. I, I have to say that I've also made choices to work on industries that I can believe on, right? And, and I feel mm -hmm. that you know I'm it's ethical, and I you know I I, I enjoy what they do. Right? No, that, mm -hmm. it, it, that you can do that with every single contracting job you do. But I think, especially for the ones you do for long periods of time, or you have mm -hmm. management responsibilities, right? So security is mm -hmm. cool because look, look, photo box, right? So I, my view that, you know, the company said, you know, we we deliver magic moments, right? And we, mm -hmm. you know, we are here to create magic moments and to, you know, make sure that granddad's birthday is, you know, is safe and this memory photos of your you know of your wedding are delivered and all this stuff so it's very personal right so my view is our job was to protect those magic moments right our job was mm -hmm. to protect those photos our job was to make sure that you know the, the system was still up and running so that we didn't mm -hmm. you know broke christmas or broke you know the family reunion right so it's mm -hmm. it's you have to always have a, a larger than life mandate right and in and in security you have that, right? In security, you you know, we you privilege that, you know, unless you're working on offensive, destructive security, right? <laughs> Which, you know, maybe there's some cases, right? Um, but even breaking stuff, right? You know, remember that when you find a vulnerability, right, and you tell them and it's not used malicious, you you know, you made the world a better place, right? Because you know, yeah. if that was done by a criminal organization or somebody with malicious intent, you no, know, there's mm -hmm. real world damage on this stuff, right? right. So Again, you know, there's there's value in breaking stuff, right? You know, nothing mm -hmm. wrong with that, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's the first one, right? Now, and I would argue that, you know, with everything, right? In fact, I, I, I kind of wrote a book called Generation Z Developers, right? Which mm -hmm. um, which is actually, you know, we can put out a link there if you want, but talks about mm -hmm. it, right? Talks about sharing and, and caring and being passionate about what you do, right? And now, when this kind of connects with the openness. So, so the thing that I've learned and um, is that, Openness, first of all, it's hard, right? Because it, it does expose a lot, right? It's not something that comes naturally. But I really got into the whole open source, and I guess I was privileged enough to leave to the whole open source mo moment. I remember reading the first open source manifest and, and all that jazz mm -hmm. and, and how that works and, and evolve and also see the open source movement going from, oh, it's communism and it's, it's, it's going to destroy the world and you're giving stuff for free and, you know, all this commercial companies, right? You know, they're the only way you can do this, right? And and, and and then you see the evolution, right? You see that actually, no, there's a balance, right? You know, it doesn't work for everything. You know, there's a commercial model that sometimes you do need commercial companies who have closed software or proprietary software because that's a model that will allow the technology to evolve or the service to evolve. But on the other hand, there's a lot of technology that should be open or information that should be open, right? And, mm -hmm. and I think what, what, what I've learned was that, you know, if you live in an open way, if you share, you make mm -hmm. yourself more efficient. So for me, right. openness is about efficiency and actually security, right? I actually really had a great conversation with my team even yesterday where we were mm -hmm. talking about where we draw the line between, mm -hmm. you know, what we share, what we don't share, you know, is sharing a network diagram or a diagram architecture, you know, mm -hmm. a security risk, right? And, mm -hmm. and my argument is that, well, there's a risk on everything you do. The question is, what is the the negative value, right, of not sharing? So basically, right. if you if you have if you don't have collaboration within a team, if you don't have an easy way to work together, um, mm -hmm. then I, I would argue that's a bigger risk to the organization than you know mm -hmm. disclosing to an attacker that you know we're using a squid proxy, right? And I would right. and a lot of things I go well, prove to me, right? Show me for the attack, you know. Uh, agent that you worry about, the threat agent that you worry about, that information mm -hmm. that we're disclosing is actually going to be, you know, super valuable because actually mm -hmm. a good attacker will be able to find most of that stuff anyway, right? right. But the advantages of sharing information is actually means that, um, you know, also what's private is much smaller, mm -hmm. right? So the, mm -hmm. the smaller amount of data that you have, the smaller amount of secrets you have, the easier it is to protect. 
But also mm -hmm. in your career, what I found was that, for example, like the way I use Twitter, right? Mm -hmm. I use Twitter as my personal search engine, right? So right. I, I tweet, you know, yes, you know, it's great to have questions. It's great to share information. It's great to get the feedback loops, right? But mainly what I do is I, you know, I use it to store stuff. So then, you know, literally every other day, I go to Twitter and I go and I search, I should say Google, I search my handle and some and a word because I know that in the past, you know, that word has been associated with something that I've discovered, some research right. I've done, and um, and basically um, I don't have to do that again, right? So, you know, you, mm -hmm. you see that in, in my world, most of the things are graphs, right? So our hyper connections and stuff like that, right? And, mm -hmm. and actually sharing information uh, allows mm -hmm. you to do that, right? Mm -hmm. And, and one, of the, one of the things that's really cool I found is that now is kind of Glasswall, which is the company I work now, right? So I'm the CTO mm -hmm. and CISO there, was mm -hmm. a, a really cool opportunity because when I, when I kind of left uh, Photobox and I was, you know, and, and, and I work a little bit for Revolut, um, it was, I had a good opportunity to actually look around, right? Because in a way, you know, I, I, I kind of did the, the thing, which is also a bit risky, but, you know, is, is worth doing was I gave my notice, right? A photo box, and then I negotiated so I could make it public very soon. And then I went to the to the community and said, hey, and I'm looking for something, right? But but it's cool because it meant that you know I was able to leverage that, you know, that community to try to find stuff and and, and people talk about it, which is great. You know, people will, again, you help people, then they help you, right? And and mm -hmm. I was giving a number of good opportunities, right? From different types mm -hmm. of companies, different types of things. And and I was kind of thinking maybe it's the right time to join a product company, right? Because I'm so mm -hmm. frustrated in how product mm -hmm. companies work. I'm so, being on the buying side, I was so mm -hmm. frustrated how, you know, I would I literally spend sometimes my, you know, a ton of time with the vendors trying to go, look, your model is not good, right? You know, you, your sales mm -hmm. pricing is really not good, you know? And they'll go, well, mm -hmm. that's what we have. It's like, well, that's not good enough. I'm the freaking client, right? I'm telling you, it doesn't work, right? I don't want to buy it like that. You know, I want mm -hmm. to buy it on demand. I want to buy it every week, every month. I want clear pricing strategies, right? I want to understand what you do. I want technical documentation, right? I want mm -hmm. access to your APIs. All those freaking mm -hmm. things that you, you would argue that you should be able to get, right? Mm -hmm. But so, so I was very frustrating not to be able to have good examples, right, uh, on, mm -hmm. on how to do that. So when Glasswall mm -hmm. and I met the CEO came along, you know, you know, I kind of and I had multiple conversations with you know other CEOs and other companies, right, and. And usually they didn't last more than half an hour, right? Because mm -hmm. you know, I, I would go with my top five major things I want to uh, achieve or, or my vision of, of ideas. And you know, halfway through, they thought I was completely bonkers, right? And you know, <laughs> it was not for them, right? And it's cool, right? Because for me, that's a great way yeah. to measure the pulse, right? But you know, when I met Danny, the CEO, I was like, look, you know, I'm all about openness, pricing on the front page. We, we, we use openness even sharing information as a corporate strategy. It's all about automation. It's all about, you know, creating great teams, you know, remote working, you know, you know, lots of, you know, which you can argue that is freaking common sense, right? And, yeah. and he was like, cool, yeah, that sounds good, right? That's a mm -hmm. nice treat, right? You know, he, he has great pragmatism and we got along mm -hmm. really well, right? So, and, and it's interesting because Glasswall, is a company that, you know, we basically rebuild files, right? So we take a file, a Word PDF, you know, image, and we create a, an object representation of that file. So you create a DOM mm -hmm. of the file. So you basically take, go to the spec and you literally mm -hmm. reverse engineer a file, just like a parser will do, right? Exactly the same mm -hmm. way. But then mm -hmm. what, 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 what we do, what our engine does is we re, rewrite the file. So we create a complete new file. So we rebuild mm -hmm. a new file only mm -hmm. using the good parts. Right, actually, mm -hmm. according to the spec, and and ironically, mm -hmm. it's a graph company, right? So you know, I found mm -hmm. myself working for a company that is fundamentally is a gigantic freaking graph, right? You take mm -hmm. a document, you build a graph, and you rewrite it, but using mm -hmm. known good, right? And, mm -hmm. and using known good is very powerful because it's one of those things that in security, it, it we know it works, right? You know, if yeah. even at a, a firewall level, even at coding level right even yeah. everywhere if you can rewrite something to a good state you stop mm -hmm. caring about looking for badness you just mm -hmm. make sure that you know what on the other side is solid right so mm -hmm. so i think what's really cool about glasswall is that fundamentally the technology is really exciting right and it's it's mm -hmm. one of those things that it, 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 even before i joined it felt like black magic right oh you're taking a file mm -hmm. you're making a uh, you're making a file safe right 
and, of mm -hmm. the, and then the whole zero day crap, right? Which, you know, they still talk about and I try to get rid of it, right? It's like, no, mm -hmm. you know, like it doesn't, it doesn't solve everything. It's not the silver bullet. It's not going to be the thing, but it's a great addition, right? It, it makes a massive mm -hmm. difference because as a CTO, for example, as a CISO, for example, I don't care about my users clicking on an email attachment, right? Because mm -hmm. they don't get anything malicious, right? So it's, it's mm -hmm. actually a really cool piece of technology and you kind of mm -hmm. are two years of, of ahead of where the market is, right? So it's really cool and exciting to be mm -hmm. building technology. And then I was mm -hmm. given basically a team that, you know, had lots of talent, but wasn't shipping very well. You know, it was kind of a little bit all over the place, had mm -hmm. literally the whole, you know, death march of development, you know, every deadline mm -hmm. was looming and then they'll finish that and there'll be another one straight away. And, and I, I was mm -hmm. actually able to use a lot of, you know, the DevOps ideas, a lot of, you know, how to structure teams effectively. And an area that we should talk a little bit is how to use security strategically to drive mm -hmm. technological changes, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's 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 quite cool. So going back to your first point, because I think it was important to give that, that introduction. I think for somebody starting on a career, right, is is literally to be, you know, pa passionate and energetic, right? And to be a great professional and to mm -hmm. be proactive. Right. Look, look at Glassroll, right? Look, we have our blog posts, right? We have, um, we share a lot of information. We're pretty open on the media, but we actually are hiring tons of people through Upwork, which so we have these massive distributed network. In fact, you know, people want to do projects, you know, we have tons of projects that we are hiring, you know, specifically. And it, mm -hmm. it's about, you know, finding a place where you add value, right? And, you know, and this could be something as simple as, going to a site, finding some stuff and documenting it quite well, right? Mm -hmm. and, and understanding, you know, you know what, what the other side, you know, how they want to consume it and, and mm -hmm. manipulate it like that, right? And present information in that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, you know, being passionate and, and being, having that attention to detail and, and learning and changing is, is one of the best things you can do for your career. All right. Absolutely. Thanks for that, uh, Dennis. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned a couple of times in the previous question was uh, graph based, especially for both the organization as well as the technology. You kind of zoomed out and zoomed in on that term a couple of times. Uh, and of course, my exposure to graphs has been mostly, you know, basic Neo4j and some basic understanding of graphs. But I think you are probably the authority, especially in the infosec world on graphs. So. Tell us a little bit about that, especially from the perspective of how you've used it and where do you think people could use it? What, what does that mean? And what does that mean for us at large as an industry? Yeah. Well, so first of all, right, you know, graphs is one of the most effective way to scale information, right? You know, and if you mm -hmm. look at the biggest companies in the world, they are all graph mm -hmm. companies, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and they, they think in graphs and they behave in graphs, right? And, uh, and, I, and I think for me, the graph epiphany was when I mm -hmm. realized that I was already thinking in graphs even before mm -hmm. I realized I was thinking in graphs. And I think most people think in graphs. Some struggle, mm -hmm. which is fair enough, right? You know, it, it's not for everybody, right? You know, I've, mm -hmm. I've met amazing individuals that, you know, it takes them a while or it doesn't click mm -hmm. natively. But I think, mm -hmm. you know, natively, right, you know, a graph, and this is, you know, basically network graph, right? You know, it's, it's mm -hmm. fundamentally nodes and edges, right? So nodes mm -hmm. are two things, an edge is a connection between those two things, right? And actually, mm -hmm. that, the irony is that I talk a lot about using Jira as a graph database, and, and is, is that mm -hmm. right? Jira is a SQL database, and it's, and it's actually mm -hmm. horrible, right, to consume mm -hmm. some of the data to navigate the stuff, but it gives, for example, something that Neo4j doesn't give, right? And it's interesting because I spoke to the Neo4j guys, you know, a couple of times and, and I presented my vision and it's, it's actually frustrating because I, I, I'm not even charging. Right? I'm mean, like, dude, just take my ideas, right? Like, just make it better. Right? I tried to use your product, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and the, because the, the, the thing about the graph, right, it's about those connections. So, so imagine like everything you do or very, or most of the stuff you do is a graph, mm -hmm. right? Because you have mm -hmm. elements and you do actions mm -hmm. on those elements. Right. So mm -hmm. even source code is a graph, right? Because you have mm -hmm. a class, you have a function, you know, and you have mm -hmm. in the methods and you have things and you have. So I think the, my first exposure probably to a graph that it kind of blew my mind was when I was doing the O2 platform and this, you know, which mm -hmm. is basically, you know, 
insane technology thing that I did a while back, which by the way, still does things that still others don't do. But it, um, it's kind of, you know, and also when I was doing static analysis with, with the Ants Labs or with, 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 this, with, the stack, with the SAST engines, right? And I kind of mm. realized that you can get the AST, right? Which is the abstract syntax tree of the source code. And, and, yeah. and that for me was like that moment, like, whoa, does that mean I can, I can code on top of code? I can query code, you know, ask mm -hmm. a simple question, for example, as, you know, where, where are all the methods? Where are all the classes, right? Where, mm -hmm. what, what are all the controllers? You know, what are all the mm -hmm. URLs after the controllers, right? All those mm -hmm. questions are hard to do, are impossible to mm -hmm. do if you do a regex, right? Or if you, if you don't have an object model of the source mm -hmm. code, right? Mm -hmm. um, you um, you can't answer those, and that was for me. Mm -hmm. the, I would say a period of my career that I was really doing, you know, lots of paradigm shifts very fast because I I suddenly went from having lots of questions that were really hard to answer to mm -hmm. a mode where I could look at any application and say, you know, I, I'll spend two days coding the architecture of the app, and then I can answer questions right that I could not mm -hmm. answer otherwise. Right, mm -hmm. and I, I also did. I didn't went to a period where I, I always would feel guilty on every pen test I did or or security review. I was always coding, and I always mm -hmm. had this thing of you know the first two three days going. I haven't found anything or anything major because I'm just freaking coding the architecture, mm -hmm. the application. And then of mm -hmm. course, once you can query it or you can do you know lots of automation on top of your questions, you find a whole bunch of stuff, right? Because mm -hmm. now you scale, right? Now you you know even look answering a simple question of Show me every single route that your application has. Now map right. the type of roles that you have. Now visualize mm -hmm. that. Now understand, you know, is everything supposed to be called, you know, by okay. the right users? That is still crazy complicated today, right? And and yes. why? Because the applications are not, you know, stored in a graph format, right? So if right. you think about it, you know, we still, you know, um, uh, in a way where most of our development platforms are not graphs. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's mm -hmm. insane because with a graph you can query, right? And and not just mm -hmm. that, right? So if you, and actually Jira is a good way to explain this, right? So 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 if you look at, for example, right, the way we now manage our projects, right? Mm -hmm. Is that we have, by the way, we have Jira tickets for everything, right? Literally, mm -hmm. you can ask me a type of thing, and we have a Jira ticket for it. So so let's say that you know we what we have is we have a program of projects, right? So that's a ticket, right? The, the, mm -hmm. the program links, I, there's another issue ticket, right? That is called project. So a mm -hmm. program has lots of projects, right? So each one mm -hmm. of those is a ticket, right? So in a way, each of those is a node. Now you can do this in JSON, right? In fact, I've done it before. So you can store this in JSON, you can store this in any, you know, now for J, right? But, but it's actually important that the node is very strong. So the, the reason I like Jira or, or JSON actually. So Jira and JSON, you can do the same thing, but Jira has an editing environment, right? Which makes it easier for the users. Is that your node has to be version controlled, right? Mm -hmm. Like your mm -hmm. node, each of these entity, if it's like, you know, if, if I describe it like this, like a node has to have a subject, right? A title, mm -hmm. has to have some mm -hmm. meta information description, uh, has mm -hmm. to have some attributes, you know, mm -hmm. you know, maybe some metadata associated with it, should have a status, mm -hmm. You know, is it mm -hmm. you and the construction done, a waiting review, whatever. So it, it's good if it has a workflow, the node. Mm -hmm. uh, ideally, it has some kind of discussion so you can comment on it. It's fully mm -hmm. versioned. So every single change is documented. And you can link between nodes, right? <laughs> so mm -hmm. uh, that's why I just described a freaking issue tracking system, right? I, I just described mm -hmm. a ticket system, right? Because that's mm -hmm. what it is, right? And, and it's very important that it's version controlled, right? So when you have mm -hmm. that, you, you start to have these very strong nodes. And I will, I will mm -hmm. arrive at the thread model in a second, right? Because you're going to find it interesting. So now mm -hmm. you've got the project, right? Okay, so the project has features. So the feature is a node, another issue mm -hmm. type. And the features have stories. And the story mm -hmm. is a node, right? And the mm -hmm. story mm -hmm. has tasks. And the task is a node. So you start to see mm -hmm. this tree, right? But then the features could have a vulnerability, right? So we mm -hmm. have, you can have a feature that have a bug or a vulnerability, right? So now you have a vulnerability and the vulnerability creates a risk, right? Mm -hmm. So what I like to think about vulnerability is to say, let's say you know, there's, you know, there's a broken authentication model. Well, let's say you have weak usernames and passwords, right? A simple mm -hmm. one, right? So that's mm -hmm. a vulnerability, right? 
And, and, and also we have facts, right? So that's another issue type that we do. And we have questions and we have decisions. Mm -hmm. All those are issue mm -hmm. types. So let's say they have a vulnerability. What we do is we ask the question, why that vulnerability is important? Why does it matter, mm -hmm. right? So you mm -hmm. can say, all right, you know, weak usernames and passwords are a problem mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. brute forcing is possible. Okay, now that's the risk, right? You brute force using it, you can brute force accounts. But why mm -hmm. is that important? Oh, that's important because unauthorized users can access mm -hmm. the application, right? Well, that right. is an apparent risk that there's going to be mm -hmm. five, six, seven different ways for unauthorized users to do that, right? And, and, and this, you know, unauthorized users might link to sensitive data being compromised, might link to, you know, loss of financial data, whatever. So now you have mm -hmm. this maybe R1 risk, you know, maybe let's mm -hmm. say brand impact or financial loss, and that mm -hmm. risk now a parent of five or six risks, right? Mm -hmm. Who are the mm -hmm. ones you can do, and that one links to the other one. So you have this, even just there, you have these five levels of risks, right? That literally one that connects to the other, but the power is to connect the risk to the vulnerability, right? Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. the vulnerability, in a way, underpins all of this, mm -hmm. right? This mm -hmm. was a cool thing when I was doing a CISO role, um, was when I realized that just about everybody I met, I asked, when you present your dashboards to the board, you know, is that thing connected to the real world, right? Literally, mm -hmm. you know, yes, you can present some nice visualizations and, you know, the more mature you are, the better the picture is. And, and some of it, you can even use some worldly maps or some, some strategic way to present the data. But literally, as the world changes in the real world, does your dashboard change, right? Can you mm -hmm. mix and match? Can you create different views, right? Based on the audience, based on the scenario, right? And just about everybody mm -hmm. said no, right? Because you know, it's really hard to connect the dots, which basically means that most management data is freaking science fiction, right? It's just a, a yes. snapshot of reality, okay, you know, that mm -hmm. what you think it is, but it's already out of date, right? Even before you finish it, and it runs on freaking yeah. spreadsheets, right? And most of the time, yeah. and of course, some people have connected a lot of dots, which is great, but, but some of it was done by a massive investment, right? So again, you know, not every team can pull that off. So for me, the attraction yeah. of the graph and the attraction of, of the Jira world was that mm -hmm. I could do all of this. But, 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 mm -hmm. but let me continue. So now you got the vulnerability, right? So now mm -hmm. the thing is like, okay, the vulnerability actually, you know, is going to be exploited by, in fact, if vulnerability affects a system. So now have an IT system or a component, which is, built, which mm -hmm. is part of another component, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, in, for example, a particular thrust boundary, right? Or zone, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then that, system, that vulnerability can be fixed by a, a mitigating control is then mm -hmm. exploited, for example, by a particular attack vector, which is done mm -hmm. by a threat agent, right? Mm -hmm. And that vulnerability actually affects a particular IT system, or sorry, a particular asset, which we can then mm -hmm. classify, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at what I just described, right, uh, is a threat model, right? Yeah, so what exactly. we're now doing, which is really cool, is we mm -hmm. actually use Jira as a mm -hmm. native way to store threat modeling data uh, in mm -hmm. a hyperlinked way. And this is very mm -hmm. powerful because, you know, the biggest challenge in security is to get stuff done, right? Is to fix things, right? And I have to tell mm -hmm. teams like, look, in security, we are massive change machines, right? So everything we do requires the business to change, right? So we basically mm -hmm. this gigantic ticketing system creator, right? Because everything we do is about doing something, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so it's very important that we become really good at knowing how to get stuff done, right? In fact, mm -hmm. at Corebox, I had a role called head of fix, right? Mm -hmm. And the guy's job, amazing individual, his whole job was to figure out and to track all the fixes, right? And mm -hmm. the thing about this, and we're doing now for something like Glasswall with my security team, I said, look, if you have a vulnerability, you know, it won't get fixed just because you ask it to. So you now need to take mm -hmm. that vulnerability, that thread model, and sometimes even the exploits if required or that old meta information. And now you need mm -hmm. to work with developers, right? So you need mm -hmm. to now get a task and, and mm -hmm. even a story for it to fix that. And now okay. that task and story has to be put in the backlog, right? Mm -hmm. Or else it won't get done. So, so the mm -hmm. coolest thing about this is that you now start to separate even all those actions. You start to understand where's the best place to do this, you know? And sometimes mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. like, oh, actually, we should solve this, not by a whack-a-mole thing. We should actually, let's say, dependency management, we should solve this by yep. you know, that fix that can go into the pipeline that actually is done by that team over there and actually mm -hmm. maybe address a bigger problem that they have with it. Right. 
Yeah. Or maybe it's, you know, we need a better authentication solution. Or maybe, you know, why, you know, security sometimes can be used to drive a truck and to, you know, to justify why a particular module is not fit for purpose, right? So, right. But, but it's important to have all those connections, right? It's important right. that when you arrive at a meeting or, or at a place where you have to make the business case to fix this, you, mm -hmm. you connect all these dots, right? Mm -hmm. Because the key element of this, and this is the, the bit where the graphs make the whole difference, right? Is that mm -hmm. in this, we also have the element of technical owner and business owner, right? Mm -hmm. And they fundamentally are, you know, the technical owner is the person who confirms and validates the finding, right? You know, basically mm -hmm. they provide at senior level, you know, say, yes, that is correct, right? It's not, you know, it's not because we say X can happen or X is a problem or X is a bug or, or whatever. You still have to mm -hmm. validate, right? So mm -hmm. that's, the but the business owner, is the one that actually controls the, the um, what's it called, the, the roadmap, right? Is the one that almost mm -hmm. has the accountability, right? So mm -hmm. it's very important that you can take all this data and present mm -hmm. it in a way that makes sense to the business owner. Right. Mm -hmm. right? This is the key thing, right? I remember the first time I told my team that we needed to create, you know, um, 20, 30, 50 decks, right? Mm -hmm. Because we have that amount of business owners. They freaked mm -hmm. out, right? Uh, but of course, <laughs> in my head, it's like, no, you're not going to make them manually. We create them from the graph. But in my head, I'm mm -hmm. like, no, you're going to have to create 500 decks, right? Because mm -hmm. you have to customize your language to the audience, right? And, and right. that's the power of a graph. Like, the power of a graph is that mm -hmm. it's it's an incremental, you know, little change and little cost mm -hmm. to make a connection where... Mm -hmm you know, you get everything else for free. So if you spend some time mapping the business owners and for example, mapping them to risks, you know, when I was talking about those risks. So actually, mm -hmm. if one of those risks is connected to a business owner, now you mm -hmm. know that every one of these three, that mm -hmm. person only cares about this mm -hmm. part of the tree. So you know right. that you know, we're talking about them about something they care about, but, mm -hmm. it's only in con but now it's already in context to what that right. person cares about. And, right. and, I, and, and this is very important. This is something that I always find, even strategically, even if when I do it without, um, you, know, you know, really explicitly, I always try mm -hmm. to reverse engineer how mm -hmm. the other person, you know, what they care about. And I try to mm -hmm. present the data that I have in a mm -hmm. way that makes sense to them. So I always right. find that, you know, if you try to get others to understand what you're saying, right, and mm -hmm. they force them to really understand where you're coming from, that doesn't scale. Mm -hmm. right? now, I'm not perfect. Right. It's not. It's not. It's not easy. But but the graph allows mm -hmm. me to play that game in the kind of right. fact-based, documented, you know, structure where there's a rational way where I say mm -hmm. this is more important than that, and we should do right. this, not that, or fix these three vulnerabilities, but don't fix these ten. Right, because actually, you know, yes, it's a massive vulnerability, but nobody can exploit it, or we can detect mm -hmm. it very fast. Where this one is a, a, a medium vulnerability, but we're being hammered, and we actually have mm -hmm. financial loss or customer data is being leaked over here. Right. So, right. so the graph, right? You know, I went mm -hmm. to the point where everywhere I look, there was graphs, right? Because everywhere you look, there's relationships, right? So, yes, the graph is fundamentally, you know, mm -hmm. an entity and a relationship, right? And you got that. Everywhere. The, the question right. is, can you capture the data so you can query it, so you can manipulate it, so you can almost, can you represent your world in, right. in a graph, right? And I think right. that is, um, is the key. And in fact, my, my recommendation, right, to every company I met, and you guys, right, is that you find that when you interact with a company, you, you are by design exposed to a graph of the company, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the thing that you'll find, and this is what I try to do at, at Glasswall now, is that we, I try to be, you know, think a lot about, for example, why don't we sell? You know, why doesn't that person buy the product? Why, why isn't the product easier to consume, right? How that works. And I always challenge me and the team to say, are we giving the other side a problem, right? You know, are, mm -hmm. we, are we not giving them stuff that it's easy for them to consume or stuff that makes sense to them in their world, right? So, so mm -hmm. I find that, for example, like if, if you are a company that suddenly start to understand where you know what's on the other side, and even the org chart, or even mm -hmm. who, right? 
and you asking sometimes that question, hey, you know, who should I talk to get this done? And, you know, you know, what, 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 what is the process to embed this on, you know, your product in the company? The problem mm -hmm. is companies, the reason they don't give you that is they don't know, right? Or mm -hmm. change is so fast that they don't have that graph, right? They don't mm -hmm. have that understanding. So I think that if you as a company or an entity provide your data in a graph mm -hmm. format, you'll find mm -hmm. that, you know, the value that you add is much mm -hmm. greater than mm -hmm. what you're doing and whatever that little, you know, you know, kind of value add that you do, which is important, but sometimes, mm -hmm. You know, it's so hard for companies to implement that or to get the mm -hmm. value because they don't even know where to plug it, right? So right. if you start to give those graphs out, you know, mm -hmm. like I, I bounty companies, right? I, I was telling them, look, you guys, if you give me a graph of who, you know, will fix this because you've been talking to people and you actually know, that will be mm -hmm. as valuable for me as the vulnerability mm -hmm. discovering, right? Because especially yeah. when you have bigger teams, right? After a while, the challenge is, is not even the vulnerability. It's like, it's like who the hell is going to fix this, right? It's who the hell yeah. has the time and the focus and the ability and who owns the code and who even knows how it works. Like all, all those real world stuff, like that last hundred meters, right, of getting stuff done is, mm -hmm. is hard. And, and for me, that's a graph, right? Because, right. you know, it, it's a very powerful way to scale, right? You're right. Absolutely. In fact, that uh, in fact, when you were talking about this, uh, I'm not sure if you've uh, heard about some code that we released called Threat Playbook. And Threat Playbook kind of works on a very similar approach. It's on GitHub. You can check check it out later on. But so we we were seeing this when we were doing threat modeling engagements, right? So there was no real there was no real mapping to the app and what was the threat model. So we used to see this massive disparity between these things. So what we did was we created a automation framework that allow you to capture user stories as YAML and then capture abuser stories, which is very similar to what you just described, which is, hey, take that user story and see what are the different ways that can be abused and then look at all the different threat scenarios, whether SQL injection, session injection, whatever it is that can be used to map out those abuser stories and then bring up that out as mitigations and security test cases. So you're essentially creating a relationship from the user story right down to you know the relationships between mitigation and test cases so that was something that uh, was very interesting because like you said you need to provide context and threat modeling in most cases is done without too much context it's done by uh, just security people which is kind of useless uh, it needs to be yeah. you know in inclusive with uh, people who are actually building the product or who own the product and yeah. that makes the bigger difference. And if you're able to give them some context in the form of an abuser story and say, hey, you know what? Uh, this login feature can be gamed this way that somebody can gain access to this. And that gives them a whole different perspective of the vulnerability. So yeah, I, I absolutely get where you're coming from in the sense that without context, security is largely meaningless to people who are not doing yeah. security. And, and that, look, I think that, that is what you want to go for, right? Like, and, the, and here's the thing, right? So what I really like about my role now is I, I get to really push, uh, you know, the security activities in, in business right. and technology context without attrition, mm -hmm. right? And, right. Um, and, um, and it, it, it's, it's quite interesting because, you know, it's still hard to do, right? It's, it's not because, you know, I, I wave my hand and go and let it happen. It happens. It isn't, doesn't work like that, right? But what it means yeah. is, for example, one of the things that, uh, I've, I, I've talked a bit about in the past, and I think I have a presentation about using threat modeling, you know, as documentation. Is I can mm -hmm. now pass, for example, you know, um, a, a policy that says, you know, every app needs to have a threat model. But mm -hmm. but the way I, I, I present it to the developers, and the way we're having success with the developers, mm -hmm. is basically, you know, and again, this is now me as a CTO. I can say, hey. I value documentation. I value architecture, right? This whole idea right. that you don't need documentation, architecture diagram is freaking bollocks, right? Because actually, yeah. you know, to go at speed, you need more, right? You know, you need, yeah, exactly. because, you know, you need to understand what you're doing, right? And in fact, you know, the whole point, you know, it has to be almost documentation as code. It has to be dynamic. Mm -hmm. It has to be fluent. But, you know, if you mm -hmm. can't present me a diagram of what the hell you're doing, right? You know, I'm worried mm -hmm. because, you know, A, you might even be going on the wrong direction, right? You know, I need to yeah. consume that, right? So, so I, I put quite a lot of pressure on the team to say, I want good documentation. I want, 
Uh, I want good test cases. I want, you know, I'm a big fan of tests, of course, right? And I want good architecture diagrams. Uh, and also going back to the open, as I said, just publish it, right? Because the irony yeah. is that when you publish that, you know, I, ironically, it's your colleague that is going to read. So we communicate better externally than internally. <laughs> right? Actually, we communicate internally via external ways. Like yeah. when I joined, there was literally people in those two floors. There was people in the top floor that I didn't even know how the other guy's name was. They have no idea what the other people were working on, right? And, yeah, and sometimes, yeah. you know, you can be somebody that's sitting two desks from you, but you have no idea what that person is doing or what has right. done. And what I found is, Again, by, by forcing it to be open, you solve actually a lot of DevOps problems. You solve where do we publish? How do we publish? Yeah. You know, where yeah. how do I upload an image? How do I upload a PDF? You know, what platforms do you use? You know, all that yeah. kind of stuff that you now need to address, right? But mm -hmm. but the most interesting thing I found with thread modeling is that, and this is something I'll, I'll recommend for you guys to do, is like the, the, the message on thread modeling actually is not to the security teams, right? You know, although yeah. thread modeling is a side effect. I, I mm -hmm. view threat modeling as a technique to document and to create a, a real world view of the application where one of the side effects is security risks, correct? But the most yes. important side effect is actually how the thing works, right? Yeah. And, and, and that's a sweet spot because you ask anybody, do you understand how that product works? Do you understand how that bit you're doing works? Do you understand that flow? Do you understand that pipeline? most likely right. they start showing you the code or they start doing a drawing, right? And you right. go, uh, and even if they have one, you know, you, you go, is that is that up to date, right? You know, it's like, yeah. oh no, you know, it's now of yeah. whatever, right? Um, yeah. So and then you ask them, do you want it, right? Like, do you find that, you know, you would like to have one when you're debugging or you're adding a new feature or you're talking about which feature is easy to add versus, you know, or what, what even to create a brief, right? Like, you know, I, I find that my challenge is that until you've done a threat model, you can't mm -hmm. effectively write mm -hmm. a brief, right? You know, how the hell do you know what you're coding on, right? Like, you know, how do you know yeah. the interconnections, the stuff? So I think threat model, it's a really sweet spot because uh, especially the way you, if, if you're doing different ways, right? But it allows you to ask really good questions, right? Which sometimes right. on a normal architecture diagram, you wouldn't ask mm -hmm. because you go, oh, that's out of scope, right? Where in security, right. nothing is out of scope, right? So, so threat right. modeling allows you to have layers. And, and I'm a big fan of doing threat modeling in layers where you mm -hmm. go by the use case and by the, almost by the, the context that mm -hmm. you, know, you got there. But I think threat modeling can add crazy value Right, but even on, on the real world, right? If you look at the way you know we handle the COVID nineteen, and you, you look at some some things that happens in the real world, you go, well, these guys never done a threat model, right? Because if they have done a threat model, they have realized that you know that will happen, and that will happen, and that will happen, and <laughs> what do I do here? And, and and in a way, threat models are a great way to ask you know the what if question, right? And and you know yeah. what will happen if this goes, and what happens with that case, and and actually. Yeah. I find to make rational decisions, right? Because I think in security, we make a lot of irrational decisions. We are very mm -hmm. guilty of making the business do things that the business actually don't need to do, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and threat models allows you to, you know, add the threat agents, you know, the, 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 the elements to the, to the mix, and then, mm -hmm. you know, be able to make a rational decision where you make, you know, I, I think about it, you should do three threat models. Like the best, the most effective threat models I've done is when, you know, you take a particular product or idea, especially early, and you create three thread models, you know, and you say, well, mm -hmm. look, you, this is super locked down. This is a bit more relaxed. This is very little security. That's interesting. And, yeah. and the risks are going to be, mm, 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 right? And you go, well, yeah. you know, which ones you want to take? And sometimes yeah. this is okay, right? Yeah. And, yeah. But, but, but you have to make it, you know, understand the context, right? And, mm -hmm. and that's, and, that, and if you go now to my, my biggest revelation in the last couple of years, which is the worldly maps, right? Because, mm -hmm. and especially when you intersect worldly maps with thread model, mm -hmm. you gain something that for me was missing in a thread model, okay. right? Because right. if you, so worldly maps, basically it's something developed by Simon Worley. It's this really mm -hmm. amazing way of thinking. I highly recommend everybody, right? You know, I, I would say I think in maps every day now, right? In fact, I would argue that maps are the evolution of a graph. So basically you start with graphs because graphs is connecting the dots, but graphs mm -hmm. doesn't have, con there's a lot of, you know, for example, a position doesn't matter in a graph. You know, you can have a node here or, or like that, or there's all sorts of things. And 
and, and there's movement doesn't exist very well. So there's all sorts of properties that a map is kind of the evolution of a graph, but you have mm -hmm. to start first with the graph because the graph gives you the nodes and edges for your map, mm -hmm. right? And a map's mm -hmm. basically, it's worldly maps, it's basically, it's like a, a graph that has a chain of needs. So this needs this, needs this, needs this, needs this. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you kind of uh, uh, map it according mm -hmm. to the evolution, right? So there's, mm -hmm. you know, like you can even say one, two, three, four, you know, you can go, mm -hmm. you can make a map where you, you know, like you have, for example, four swim lanes and, you know, one lane is, you know, highly insecure to very secure, right? Uh, but usually mm -hmm. the map that Simon, you know, promotes a lot and talks a lot is this map where it talks about, you know, genesis, uh, custom build product and commodity, right? Commodity, yeah. And and it's very important. Like, if you look at thread model, it's very important to see where you are, right? And, and where, mm -hmm. you know, where's the practices and where's the problem? And and actually, you know, when you, when you look at this is you see that most things evolve, right? So I would say thread modeling in a lot of cases is still on the custom build, right? It's still very art. It's more art than science and there's some efforts to productizing it but it's still yeah. kind of very immature but you know that you know eventually evolve eventually you know you get a lot of activity in the product space it gets more and more adopted and eventually becomes a commodity right uh right. But, but it's really cool to think about you know the movement and what will happen next right and also like even for example from a, a thread modeling point of view right um mm -hmm. the mistake that we, a lot of times we do is we don't put context into the things. We don't put yeah. situation awareness. So let me give yeah. you an example. If you're developing four products, right, or you have four products you're reviewing, and one mm -hmm. is on the genesis stage, one mm -hmm. is on the custom build, one is on product, one is on, on, on um, commodity, commodity or industrialized, I would argue, in fact, we're now doing this internally, that almost like the vulnerability budget, like the risk budget for each one is very different. Right? right when you're doing something genesis right if mm -hmm. i even talk about slas right so the sla mm -hmm. in genesis mm -hmm. is actually one percent right it's five percent mm -hmm. what you want is mm -hmm. for the thing to work right you're like you don't know if it's going to work so genesis is that innovation right is that right. spark like, i, I want to do something right and it's all right. about experimenting failing fast doing lots of stuff going on sorts of tangents right and then hopefully mm -hmm. one will work right you know like i said if it works 1% of the time, in fact, you usually start working 0% of the time, right? So once right. you work 1% of the time, it's a massive success, right? Because you've mm -hmm. got it to work, right? It might be completely chewing gum. It might be completely, you know, um, all over the place. But the point is you work, mm -hmm. right? Like, let's say, yeah. you know, we're adding a new, you know, file format, right, to our Glasswell engine, right? The first step is, can we even do it, right? Can we even read the file? Can we even yeah. rebuild the file? Can we even look what's inside, right? So the SLA at that moment in time should be very low and the vulnerabilities that you're willing to accept should be high. Like you can literally have, mm -hmm. because the thing is not connected to everything, right? So, yeah. so you can now need to put into context. Now, if you have something on a custom build, that is mm -hmm. different. Now that it starts to put together. So you can now start to argue that the vulnerabilities that you will accept there mm -hmm. are very different right from from mm -hmm. the other one but you can still say that like we did this right so we could say that at at the, the custom build phase you can have mm -hmm. no authentication you can have no authorization you can have secrets mm -hmm. in the source code <gasps> Look, mm -hmm. secrets in the source code right who cares right if that secret is not used anywhere right or if you use locally right or you know if it's on a private repo that you know only accesses a development environment that is completely isolated you know yeah is he a major problem right now? Yeah, okay, it's annoying. Yes, it's bad practice. You know, I view mm -hmm. more those things as pollution because I think you should have modules that make you not even care about that. But yeah. am I going to care about? Probably not much, right? Because it's it mm -hmm. doesn't have no customer data. It's not used by anybody. All we're doing is trying to make something that it's a bit more reliable. It's cool. Mm -hmm. Now, when mm -hmm. you move from custom build to product, that's when mm -hmm. you want to put the security features, right? That's when you right. want to you know, you know, race. And now, of course, depending on the where the product maturity is and depending on who's using it and also depending how you market it, right? Mm -hmm. it's, I would argue, again, your security budget, your vulnerability budget, like the vulnerabilities that you're willing to accept and the risks that you're willing to accept are going to be different. And, and this yes. actually takes you to another very important point where if you don't explain this to senior management, right, and to the stakeholders, especially to the sales guys, right, or the consumers, right, it's very mm -hmm. easy to make bad decisions it's very easy right. to look at something that now looks like a product 
and going, mm -hmm. great, we can we can use this, we can sell this, we can use this for all these use cases. And actually, mm -hmm. if you have a thread model, you can say, actually, no, right? Actually, mm -hmm. this system, for example, doesn't have a good authorization model, which actually means mm -hmm. that although you might have different types of users, the isolation between the users is almost like security theater, right? It's just usability, right? So at the moment, mm -hmm. our user management is a usability feature. It's not a security mm -hmm. feature, right? Now, mm -hmm. that's not a problem if every user that uses the system is trusted, right? If, mm -hmm. if, if it's not a problem, if all users have access to, let's say, the files that that system is going to process, mm -hmm. why is that vulnerability, right? They already have access anyway. It's just, yeah. you know, usability, right? But if you sell yeah. it or you want to use it as there's real isolation between the users, mm -hmm. now, that risk becomes very different. Right. And that's why it's important that every vulnerability and every risk is accepted, right? Every vulnerability mm -hmm. has to be accepted and in a way underwritten by, you know, a, a business owner and eventually the customer because you want to make sure that the deployment, where the thing ends up, is taken into account. Mm -hmm. So the way we mm -hmm. do this is we now have this really cool development model where we basically mm -hmm. say that there's POCs, MVPs, VPs, and Ps. So POCs mm -hmm. is, is the genesis. MVPs is the minimal viable prototype, which is a mm -hmm. great concept, which is something that works and is kind of, you know, it's fully functional. You can explore it. You can use it to define the product, but it's, it's a mm -hmm. prototype, right? Then you have mm -hmm. viable products, which mm -hmm. is basically when we start to put DevOps practices, we start to productize it, we start to, you know, see what it will take to do this, maybe mm -hmm. have a couple of clients or users using it, you know, and then becomes a product, which is when mm -hmm. you now hand it over to the SRE team, when it basically becomes fully supported, strong SLAs. And it's really cool that now we're looking at, for example, from a security side, again, the error budget for each of these is very mm -hmm. different. Right? We'll accept mm -hmm. the vulnerability in a POC that we don't accept in, um, in a P. Now, the yeah. interesting thing of this, and, and, and it was quite interesting how the, the team started to evolve, was that we start because we have a really good SRE because we run systems in production and we you know we we respond for email systems so Glassdoor have this thing where we can process your emails which is cool mm -hmm. but it means that we run email servers in production right which is you know mm -hmm. <laughs> very mm -hmm. very stressful and and very high risk yeah. right? which is cool but we we got that done really well we got a great SRE team we even have a SRE dot Glassdoor in a website mm -hmm. but that means that that team start to understand that hold on we're going to be given the P product, the VP products, right? Because they manage the P's. So they start to mm -hmm. say, well, hold on. If the VP teams start to create things in the technology stack that we use, in the mm -hmm. practice that we use, in the DevOps workflow that we use, then the mm -hmm. jump from VP to P is smooth, right? Because there's not a yeah. lot of work to be done, right? So we start yeah. to think like this. That, look, the reality is that although it might not care about certain things on the, the, the VP or the MVP stage or the POC, the better mm -hmm. controls or modules or, or bits that we can give them so they don't care about certain things, they only care mm -hmm. about what they're innovating, the faster mm -hmm. it is to take mm -hmm. an idea to a product, mm -hmm. right? right. And, and, and that's key because the other thing that we're doing is we, we're breaking, for example, the email platform into all sorts of mini products. We're breaking, mm -hmm. it's kind of like we're productizing everything we do because the idea is to create best in class elements that each mm -hmm. is lives by itself we could even sell it independently but more importantly mm -hmm. each has its own pipeline it has its own threat models it has its own environment we can test it independently it survives by itself mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so that we have you know eventually our main products has become these lego of these mm -hmm. multiple p's that you kind of put together and mm -hmm. um and you kind of, you know, you have that pipeline of then how do we take products very fast mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. an idea or a customer requirement uh, or a need for a feature that goes, you know, and every feature, if you think about it, goes from that step, right? Every feature goes right. from, you know, genesis to custom build to product to commodity, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, and, and also what's interesting is, I, I, and this is what I want to do with, and again, you think about it, it's a graph, right? What I want to do mm -hmm. is I want to start to put more or less requirements depending mm -hmm. again where it is and you know on mm -hmm. worldly maps one of the biggest things that simon talks about is is context right you know you you mm -hmm. have to know that the practice that you do in a product you know activity is very different that you do in you know a genesis on the other question mm -hmm. is if you if you find yourself developing products that you can buy or you, you mm -hmm. can outsource that already somebody has commoditized 
you have to mm-hmm. ask yourself, is it worth my investment, right? Yeah. Is it worth yeah. me investing here because mm-hmm. I can get that? Or, you know, maybe it is, right? I mean, because that's my our magic sauce. Maybe that's, or maybe mm-hmm. the market is not good enough, right? For what yeah. we wanted to do, right? But I, I view yeah. thread modeling as the, a massive glue on this because, because so, because so my, my party trick, right? So <laughs> my daughter, uh, my, yeah. my party trick, right? With, um, with the with developers, right? Is kind of saying, oh, no, with business owners, right? This is important with the project managers is to basically say, do you understand the security implications of that feature? Right? Do you mm-hmm. know, you know what are the security implications of what you're about to do? And if they say right. no, I go, cool, here's a risk for you to accept. Right. right. Because remember that not knowing is a fact, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. You, you know, because I can say, you don't know this. Prove me wrong, mm-hmm. right? If I ask you a question mm-hmm. and if you don't have an answer, that is a mm-hmm. fact, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, a, a fact is that that company or that team or whatever doesn't understand the security implications of Mm -hmm. that new feature, accept Mm -hmm. risk. And what you Mm -hmm. find is business owners Mm -hmm. are really allergic to accepting risk, especially when they don't understand it. So what you basically say is that, you know, if you then ask me, you know, so you ask them, hey, you know, also do you understand implications and and do you have documentation? Do you have Mm up-to-date documentation? And they always Mm -hmm. go, yeah, yeah, we'll we'll do it eventually. It's on the backlog, right? So again, Mm -hmm. you can add a risk to say, you don't have up-to-date documentation of mm-hmm. your product. If you want to be really a bit harsh, you can say you don't understand how your product works, right? <laughs> right? Which, to be fair, I've seen people mm-hmm. willing to accept because they're like, well, yeah. it's true, right? You know, the developer team is long gone, right? You know, yeah. I, I, you know we don't understand how the thing works. We understand how it yeah. behaves, yeah. right? No, but yeah. we don't, you know, can you do a fix? No, nope. nobody's been there for ages, right? <laughs> So, so it's very interesting. And then what we then say is like, look, if you accept these risks, then mm-hmm. a threat model is a way to do that. So, so basically, mm-hmm. so the logic here is that if you have not done a threat model by design, you don't mm-hmm. understand the security implications, and literally in just about every case, you don't have up to date documentation, right? right? So that's the business case. So that's the right. case to say, you know, the reason why you need to add this to your backlog, and the reason mm-hmm. why you need to add. You know, this uh, make sure your your team has time to do this is because mm-hmm. you know you need to answer those questions. Mm-hmm. So I found that you know when you can talk like this, very, mm-hmm. you get very little pushback. The only the question mm-hmm. is always how do we scale it, right? You know, you can't mm-hmm. take the dev team a day off from their work, right? Mm-hmm. How do you now scale from the security team so that mm-hmm. within a couple of meetings of a couple of sessions in a couple of hours? And I actually mm-hmm. think that this remote working is going to do mm-hmm. a lot of help because, again, the biggest problem we had was always getting the right people at the right time. And I actually right. think that, you know, starting to embrace the idea of doing remote thread models, even if some mm-hmm. people are in the room, but actually have remote thread models where we can say, doesn't matter where you are, we'll, you know, right. you dial in and just give us half an hour of your time or an hour. It's easier to do that, right? Yeah. Or on it, right? So, so the big epiphany for me was that worldly maps give mm-hmm. context to threat models. Mm-hmm. So if you take right. a threat model, look, a simple example, you take a threat model and you, you map it straight mm-hmm. away on even mm-hmm. the Genesis custom build, uh, et cetera, immediately you have a better sense, right? But, yeah. but there's other things you can do. You, you can, I did a, a, a map once where I basically took the threat model and each of the components, I map it mm-hmm. of how fast can they push a fix, right? Mm-hmm. Or how fast they can fix it. And it was like, mm-hmm. From and this is like the CEO or whatever the, the director said, fix it now, right? Like this is like assuming there's no political barriers, how fast mm-hmm. can you fix a vulnerability in that component, right? And it would go from two hours a day, you know, a week, not possible, right? And you'll be surprised, right? There's a lot of places where you they they don't have the source code, right? Or it's not on your control, right? Or yeah. It's a week because the vendor has to do it. Or last time they tried to push a fix, they broke half production, right? So nobody's comfortable pushing a chain mm-hmm. in here less than a week, right? And it's interesting. Right. If, you, if you do that, you then start to say, mm-hmm. hold on, where's my biggest risk, right? You know, mm-hmm. because, and this is the irony, right? The irony is that sometimes having a vulnerability on a system that you can patch or you can fix very quickly is less mm-hmm. risky than a vulnerability mm-hmm. on a system that you can fix effectively. 
Mm -hmm. See what I mean? Because the, yep. the next thing you want to map out is how much two hours of damage cost versus a week cost. So you might find right. that this vulnerability is big, but actually mm -hmm. we'll be able, we can detect it easily if it mm -hmm. happens and we can fix it easily. So, so now you're depending on the attacker being able to pull off everything, right? Mm -hmm. In two hours or four hours, right? That window right. there, right? Uh, which right. again, you know, is sometimes not that realistic. But you might right. have another vulnerability here, which actually is less sexy or le feels less, you know, is not as critical as that mm -hmm. one. But because mm -hmm. the attackers will, can take a week to exploit it, mm -hmm. right, suddenly that becomes a massive problem. So you might right. realize that actually you need to put something in front of it. You need to, you need to now, and, and, and this is the thing, like if you think like this, you start to mm -hmm. realize that, you know, you need to apply your defenses and apply your security fix budget, right? In mm -hmm. the places where you're going to be the most efficient. But All in right. a normal threat model, you don't get mm -hmm. that, right? You just mm -hmm. get this, you know, out of context a lot of the times, at least especially mm -hmm. without the teams, you know, mm -hmm. list of vulnerabilities and, and, and risks, right? And it's important right. that you you apply all these different layers, right, mm -hmm. of of analysis to to the thing. Because even if you think that it's super easy to fix, mm -hmm. there's nobody to fix it, right? Or if the side effects, you know, are very hard, you know, mm -hmm. then it's not easy to fix, right? Because right. you know, it's sometimes you know one line of code can you know can be super hard to do, right? Yeah, absolutely. So we're almost out of time, but I do have one question um, for you. Uh, now, of course, I see, I mean, you're obviously very uh, deeply entrenched in the serverless side of the fence. I know that. Uh, I've also recently seen you do a little bit of work around Kubernetes. Now, uh, given the progression of what's happening, especially with the cloud, you know, event-driven architectures and uh, Kubernetes and more, you know, in, I'm, I mean, in the general, the way, you know, the application development is happening, which is more microservice event driven architecture centric, which seems to be the case, uh, at least as it's evolving. What do you see as, you know, predictions for AppSec? I, I, I hate to use that term, but since you've seen AppSec for a very long time, I think you're in a better position to make a few more educated predictions than the rest of us. What, what do you see as AppSec evolving over the next two, three years or even beyond um, that? Yeah, well, I, I guess the first one is I, I think I think our AppSec is is getting a a, a good level of, of maturity, right? Um, mm -hmm. Although I, I I still think that there's there's a lot of components that we still miss at scale, right? And and mm -hmm. a lot of it actually is to do with you know static analysis, visualization, you know, a lot mm -hmm. of these tools, and it's a it's a weird mix because you know some of this has been done commercially. The problem mm -hmm. is that you know, if, if it's not at the price point or it's not in a way that everybody can use it, um, mm -hmm. then, you know, it's that commoditization, right? There's a whole lot of markets that doesn't exist, right? So, right. so I think we, we, we are, the AppSec now has a, is a sweet spot because, you know, I think there's a lot of technology are maturing at, at this moment in mm -hmm. time. And there's a lot of practices that, you know, we now, we, we know how to do it, right? The question is how to do it at scale, you know, how to, how to find right. ways to commoditize that other bit, right? And and a lot of it, you know, basically it's about, you know, the whole move to set DevOps, right? The whole move of, of DevOps, of automation is, is key because that's where you put security, right? That's where you really make security scale. So I think you see a lot of a lot of that. My 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 hope, right? You know, which is, you know, it's where you're gonna see more and more and more of those kind of graph-based structures where you can actually start to have these fact-based discussions and things like mm -hmm. for example, graph. Graph QL or code graph something that the, for the GitHub is code QL. 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 Because again, that is bringing that to a, a wider level. Mm -hmm. The thing that I, I, I've been saying for a while is that your application, right, is not just the code, right? Your application is everything, right? Now, mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of serverless, right? I push serverless everywhere, although serverless is not Lambda, right? In fact, ironically, Lambda and Azure Functions there's, is not as serverless as people think, right? Because if you do a thread mm -hmm. model, right, you realize that. Yeah. They recycle the whole thing, right? So yeah. for us, it's a problem, right? So for example, when you do a thread model on Lambda, right, you realize that it's not fit for purpose, right, to do mm -hmm. some of the analysis because you know if you pop the engine with one file, the next file will be compromised, right? So, mm -hmm. but I think that that alignment with the sec DevOps is massive. But I would also say that if you can embrace Kubernetes, right, and, and Kubernetes is important for a, a big reason, right? Is it's, it's mm -hmm. just like Docker that normalized 
the the kind of the packaging of 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 applications, right? And even if you think about it, if you're running a serverless, right, you're running on top of a Docker engine, right? Like you know, you might not realize it, but you are, right? You basically yeah. you're running on top of Docker. It's a process or or, or similar thing, right? It's a process that yes. has been isolated to run a function. It's fine. We just we just commoditized everything for it, but you still have it, right? You need to understand it. Right, um, but the, the the Kubernetes, right, and, uh, and we have a number of projects that we're leading, and I, I'm making sure that you know the first step is to build a Kubernetes nav native environment because what Kubernetes gives you is this ability mm -hmm. to scale, right, and mm -hmm. an ability mm -hmm. to run. Like you know, I wish I had freaking Kubernetes cluster when I was doing massive code analysis, right, because I was hitting performance problems, right. But if you think about mm -hmm. it, you know, the Kubernetes it, for any engine gives you this mm -hmm. ability to break every bit of work that you do into individual pods and then you mm -hmm. have this implementation right that yeah. comes with. so kubernetes kind of allows you to start to think about how do i instrument mm -hmm. my my analysis right so so if you mm -hmm. think about that on a, on, a, on a on a devops pipeline and i haven't mm -hmm. seen this done very well or you know some people do it behind the scenes but i would like to see more is that imagine your your threat models or your sec devops workflow Actually, mm -hmm. what you want to do is spin up a Kubernetes cluster, right? And now it's a question mm -hmm. of adding pods. And so the cool thing of the Kubernetes cluster is that once you got it running locally, you can make it run, you know, even on a VM. And then you can start to use the native ones. Although the native mm -hmm. guys, they always try to hook you into their own stuff, right? But mm -hmm. it's easy when you start native first. But then you can just add hardware, right? Like then, you know, you, you can get amazing machines, right? You know, on mm -hmm. Azure or, or, or AWS or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Google Cloud. Mm -hmm. And, but you only you know you only pay them for a little bit, right? So actually, you scale very fast. And and the mm -hmm. and the power of that is that you can use those pods to create mm -hmm. all the artifacts. So you can start to imagine that you know the code comes in, you do a first pass where, for example, you do a whole bunch of static analysis, you build all sorts of object models, you build the application, then you fire up you know, dynamic versions of that and all the dependencies. And then you have lots of logging here. And then, mm -hmm. you know, you start to write tests for the actual mm -hmm. environment. You start to write tests for what happens. You you run automated tests. You put, you know, put Zap on it. You know, you, you run all sorts of things on it. But mm -hmm. but you create that environment, right? And then yeah. again, look at your threat model. Like your threat model should be created from data that comes mm -hmm. from here. Right, so the next you know evolution of threat model is that it stops being something that you know you go this is how I think it works to this is reality, right? Mm -hmm. So a simple example is that if you create a threat model just based on a, a Kubernetes or a Docker, you know, or even a uh, you know an application config file, but let's say you know mm -hmm. a Docker environment. Right? If you take a Terraform you know structure and yeah. you extract that into an object model that you mm -hmm. then put that in a threat model. What you now mm -hmm. have is a real-world threat model, right? right? And you have a situation where when somebody connects a dot that shouldn't be connected, you get an alert, mm -hmm. right? And that's the key, right? And and by the way, like you know, I, I, we're now developing this stuff, you know, at Glasswall, and and again, I tell my team to collaborate, and if anybody wants to be involved in doing stuff like this, you know, that's kind of you know, you know, what, what we're working on. You know, I think one of the guys created this really cool thing they call it Scotty Bot. Because I kept, I mm -hmm. kept saying that that team is like Scotty on Enterprise, right? Like they make sure the thing can always fly, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Scotty bot, right? But the idea mm -hmm. is that stuff. The idea is to to use this automation, right? And and, and especially Kubernetes, um, right. which I, I highly recommend, right? You know, you you to use and and, and the concept is basically that you want to make sure that you can run it all mm -hmm. off a Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. platform that can run locally on your laptop or on your Raspberry Pi cluster or on an EC2 yeah. server, right? And it's important yeah. that everything that you need, right, from mm -hmm. data systems to logging to monitoring to visualization to doing the tasks to running tests to creating graphs, all of it has to mm -hmm. be, you know, even, you know, I've been in case in the past where I will put a version of GitLab on it. No, so what was it called? Ah, oh, there was one. Can't remember. Like a version of Git, right? So yeah, you can actually still store stuff on in a Git like format because it's mm -hmm. only when you have that that you can then mm -hmm. ask the question. Okay, if I did this now on the cloud on AWS, mm -hmm. which components mm -hmm. can I use? Mm -hmm. Which components? Maybe I'm going to use S3. Maybe I'm going to mm -hmm. use this other thing. And um, mm -hmm. and 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 I guess my last recommendation is that. 
you know, start seeing the whole thing as your app, including yeah. the AWS or the cloud account, right? Yeah. So one, one of the changes that we're doing is we, we're moving from a multi-tenant environment where we, we provide, you know, one SaaS solution that has multiple customers to literally a single tenant environment that we, we so our security boundary is the, the account. And, and for right. example, this is very interesting because we already do that for a bunch of test stuff. So we actually had a situation where, you know, in one of the test accounts, somebody spin up a VM that actually had an RDP port open, that actually some, some guys got in there and they actually put ransomware inside that machine. Mm -hmm. It actually was mm -hmm. a collection process. We detected it. But the coolest thing was we then said, okay, what is the blast radius? And instead of spending yeah. a lot of time figuring out the blast radius, because, you know, yeah. after a while it can be a bit difficult, we just destroyed the whole thing. It says, look, there's yeah. no customer data. There's nothing that is sensitive. We already benefit yeah. from having the isolation, right? right? So then we did it. But it's, right. And it's interesting because from a threat modeling point of view, you can ask the question, what happens if this gets compromised? What happens if that gets compromised? So suddenly yeah. the risks are much lower because as, as long as our root master account doesn't get compromised, right? And again, yeah. you can monitor and manage that by the SRE team and very careful or by the test environments, everything else becomes disposable, right? right. And that, you know, that is actually super critical. And, and that's a good yeah. example of, you know, stuff that um, from, um, you know, uh, from a, a thread modeling point of view, you you mm -hmm. you ask those questions, right? And you are, you yeah. arrive at good answers because you you can challenge your assumptions, right? Yeah, yeah. In fact, we were uh, we've been doing a lot of uh, automating or parallelizing tests, uh, a lot of security tests on Nomad and Kubernetes both, and we're we're, we're kind of early stages there, but uh, we're still kind of uh, Nomad. Uh, we've started to prefer Nomad a little bit more because you can do non-containerized workloads as well. Uh, since you brought up CodeQL, I'm not sure if you've checked out SEMgrep. Have you checked out SEMgrep? No. It's actually uh, really cool. Uh, and it kind of does what CodeQL does, but without the, the complexity of the query language. So I really like that as well. So you, I think you uh, will particularly enjoy that project. It's called SEMgrep. It's, it's a pretty interesting project as well. Oh, uh, that's good. Yeah. Uh, this will be really good, really fun. Yeah, no, uh, let me just turn off. So uh, thanks so much, Dennis. Uh, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, and Dennis has a very interesting book called the Gen Z uh, Developers. I'm just going to put that out there and also put it in the show notes once this episode is out there. Uh, and yeah, you should check out what Dennis has to say on his book. I'm sure he adds a lot more context and value uh, that we've discussed as part of this conversation in his book. So you should definitely check it out. Dennis is Definitely one of the brightest minds in AppSec that you should definitely yeah. be looking at. You could also get it from Amazon, which is a cool thing because I, I think it's priced like like two pounds or four pounds or something like that. But it's a good oh, example yeah. of productizing it, right? So I developed it on LeanPub, then I took the PDF, yeah. put it on Amazon, so I have zero stock, right? You know, it's just <laughs> sell every now and then, but it's cool, right? But and I like physical books too, right? So it's a uh, so you have CICD to the book writing process. Exactly, as well. so right? That's the thing. You CICD everything, man. Right? <laughs> Thanks so much, Dennis. Cool.